Hello and welcome to the show. We're just a handful of friends sharing stories and talking about, well, anything and everything from film to TV to sports and politics. It's all fair game here. Tonight's topic is the new series Years and Years, now streaming on HBO Max. This episode's panel includes Lindsay Hayes, Mark Robertshaw, and Eric Stein. The series is produced by Joan Peterson, and I'm Christian Clarnell. Welcome to the show. Let's jump right in. As a quick program note, there will be spoilers here, so proceed with caution. Additionally, this program is intended for a mature audience, so listener discretion is advised. For those of you unfamiliar with the series, it's written by Russell T. Davies, who is known for shows such as Queer as Folk and the recent revival of the very popular Doctor Who franchise. As a quick primer, the show follows a middle-class English family from Manchester, the Lions. The matriarch, Muriel, and her adult grandchildren, Stephen, Edith, Rose, and Daniel, are dealing with their typical day-to-day lives in modern-day England. Stephen, the eldest grandson, works in the financial sector. He and his wife, Celeste, have two girls, Ruby and Bethany. Edith, the older granddaughter, is an activist. She's absent for most of the first episode. She's off on some humanitarian trip in another part of the world. She's spoken of throughout the episode, but we don't meet her until the end of the show. Rose, the younger granddaughter, is a single parent, and she's pregnant with her second child from as many fathers. The fathers, apparently, are out of the picture. Daniel is the youngest, and he works at a refugee camp that provides temporary housing for asylum seekers. He gets engaged to and then marries his partner, Ralph, in the first episode. Their mother has passed away, and their father has been rarely seen over the years, and they seem to be just fine with that. Another pivotal character not associated with the family is Vivian Rook, a populist political commentator turned politician expertly portrayed by Emma Thompson. The first episode takes us through five years' time, from 2019 to 2024. In the show's version of the immediate future, Donald Trump is elected to a second term in the U.S. Political tensions are high, and Vivian makes a name for herself as an outspoken woman who says what others are thinking. Financial systems in the U.S. and elsewhere are being stressed to the brink, and the refugee crisis in the U.K. and around the world continues to worsen. By 2024, the end of the episode, we will see tensions between the U.S. and China boil over to the point where Trump launches a nuke at a Chinese-made artificial island, throwing confusion and turmoil even further out of control in the already tense global atmosphere. See? I warned you there'd be spoilers. So, I heard about this show a short time ago from an old high school buddy on Facebook. His post was really impassioned, and as it happened, I was looking for something to watch anyway, and so I figured I'd watch the premiere episode. But after binging the first four episodes, I looked at the clock and saw that it was 3.30 in the morning, and so with some hesitation, I turned off the TV. But the next morning, I devoured the rest of the series and immediately told Mark about it. Mark, it took you a few days to check it out, but I think you ate it up almost as quickly as I did. Uh, What were your first impressions? I thought that it was captivating because it hit so close to home. I thought it was a little too real, so it wasn't comfortable to watch. But I go, uh, the the foreshadowing of what could happen uh, just kept me really intrigued. Eric, what was your thought after your initial viewing of this? I was um, feeling rather hip, uh, to be honest with you, because <laughs> I, uh, my wife, Jackie, and I watched this show a year ago right now. So yeah. I feel like we were ahead of the curve. I was doing a, a show for PCPA and one of the, my castmates came in and said, I just watched this show on HBO. And she said that it was terrifying, which is something I would usually avoid. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of scary things. But once she explained why it was terrifying, I, and once I found out Emma Thompson was in it, I was like, well, we got to check this out. We were, gosh, really intrigued and disturbed by it. And we actually processed it a little differently than you all because we couldn't binge it. We, we kind of went, oh God, I'm going to have to take this in little doses. So it took us probably a month to watch the whole thing because we would watch an episode and then um, wait almost a week sometimes before we were like, are you, do you, are you ready? Can you manage this? Um, or we're going to sit down and watch. I think the last two episodes we did in one shot, I thought it was so well-written. I didn't realize at the time that the person at the helm of the show was uh, kind of the, the person who brought Dr. Who back, Russell Davies, this guy who, who really revived Dr. Who and, and really made it the pop phenomenon that it is. You know, he's, written, he's done so many other really exciting 
sh- television shows and uh, limited series as yeah, well. Queer, queer as folk is one yeah, of those. And, yeah. Um, that very British scandal right. um, also, which I, th- I think is the title. It's quite good. But I think it was really Emma Thompson that made Jackie and I tune in and then realizing how well written it is. Uh, but the thing that that was terrifying was how unbelievably plausible it is. I don't know if we're worried about spoilers or anything, Christian. Am I avoiding what what is what's going to possibly come later? Um, well, I no, at least not for this, because I, I I would like to think that if you're listening to this, you probably already seen it yeah. uh, if you haven't just be aware that there may be spoilers so well, there's your, there's if, your you ha- if you haven't stopped stop listening and <laughs> go and go watch it now okay so um but i would say um there i mean there totally is the coronavirus the they get a respiratory illness that um starts to sweep through um the refugee camp and and emma thompson's just gonna let them all die so i was like holy crap um this is like what's what's beyond prediction it's like yeah. you know when, when you know, nostradamus type. yeah 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 say, say it again Lindsay. prescient prescient that's even fancier than i was thinking but i'm gonna say it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's nostradamic like um <laughs> it's just so anyway i was um i thought it was incredible and i also was quite taken with the performances just incredible performances across the board yeah, this uh, this family, the Lyons family, the matriarch is the grandmother. The parents are kind of out of the picture. And then the adult children are living their own separate lives and then coming together as a family. The characters are, are kind of like a real family. They're all very different. They clearly love each other, but have their own problems. And I'm just wondering, Lindsay, as a teacher of literature, how did the characters work for you as far as uh, their uh, difference and uh, their relationships? Oh, well, I mean, uh, perfectly um, relatable, perfectly despicable, <laughs> uh, perfectly admirable, sometimes within the same scene, sometimes within the same sentence. And I enjoyed that about them, although I have to admit that, you know, certain characters like Celeste just got my hackles up, you know, with almost everything that she said. Uh, but they were intriguing in terms of their family dynamic. I mean, it, really accurate, really, uh, really strong. You remember when Edith gets on the phone with them finally on the computer at the end, right? And they just won't shut up, right? You know, she can't they, can't tell them what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I just it's, sometimes it's like my family, and you know, and you just want to shake them all. And that's what I feel like they're they're really realistic. But you, you know, I'm glad you asked me that question, but I was actually prepping to answer the same question that <laughs> Mark and Eric did. Yeah, do it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so the struck by the title, Years and Years, a nice generic sort of title, you know, nothing very specific about it, which years and years, but you get this sense of a progression of things going on. Right. It felt just very like generic and relatable. And then did you guys notice in the opening sequence with the numbers flipping that then goes to years and years that it has a similar sort of feel to Black Mirror? Just a oh, little. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like like a quick, quick and then uh, just the sound of it. And it had like an arpeggiated sort of like, which is then, uh, who's the composer is Murray Gold, who is also right. on Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Uh, put into the the big theme that happens later the into the future theme that in the end then just like dissolves into absolute chaos so like i just want to say that like everything about this from the characters to the opening to the the music that was just amazing just pulled me in and i agree with everything that you guys say about the discomfort of it i mean this has been a year where i've tried to actively avoid discomfort in what I'm watching because I just can't take it anymore. And this is one that felt okay to push through. I wanted to. Right. Yeah. Speaking of the music, it, it was not always comfortable. Uh, some of the uh, chord progressions and the clashing harmonies were really aggressive, which helped fuel the, the intensity of a lot of the scenes. Mark, you're a music director. What, what did you feel about the music? Did it work for you? You know, what I felt is that I liked the use of, for example, hymnal choral works to try mm-hmm. to like almost give uh, this is the numb reality of what's happening in certain sections. Um, and then, yeah, the the building tension 
was super effective inside of it. I, I actually didn't notice the music as that much of a tool because, and I think that's a, a credit to the, their, their use of it because it just, it, it was such a great um, extension of what was happening. So it just felt very natural. But um, yeah, you know, some of the old, you know, there was, there's a comfort in listening to um, music we know um, and then there's a discomfort in listening to music we know that's different than, it, it, for example, using the chant hymn where it's actually not a real hymn. It's just alternate, it's just chord progressions of chant hymn that's supposed to be reverent to something, but actually is mm-hmm. speaking to an ill angel in a way. I wasn't ready for that. That's, <laughs> no, that's so fascinating. I love that because I, I don't know how to identify that type of stuff but I, but I feel it. And so when mm-hmm. you, when you talk about it, Mark, I'm like, Oh my God, that's right. That's what I felt like. But I, in the moment I didn't recognize it, which, you know, is such a great thing about a score when, when you don't really notice it at the time, but then when you go back and analyze yeah. it, it's, um, you know, there are a few shows I've seen recently where one of them is devs. The, the music inside of that was fantastic. And then listening to some of the interviews on that, uh, reminded me of how Sorkin writes as well, where he actually sometimes the song's the first thing, and then you write the play towards someone's going to jail, someone's, you know, you know, you have those kind of episodes where you're like, wow, how did they get that perfect song to, <laughs> to go there? Sorkin, actually, Sorkin slow jams, man. Yeah, <laughs> Sorkin, Sorkin, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Devs does the same thing where it's 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 uh, it just masterfully intertwined inside of the story where oh my gosh, this couldn't have existed without the music. This one I felt was similar, but I thought it was, yeah, it was more nuanced. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Mark. And I was, I went back and listened to it again and tried to look up stuff about that uh, Into the Future anthem. Um, and it's got this clock ticking in it that starts it off. It's got a high pitched uh, sort of, what do you call it? Is it tinnitus when you, you know, you're the yeah, high pitched yeah, yeah. volume of ear? It has that running through the beginning. And then it begins that, like, it's the sound that uh, people create or uh, music that people compose when it's beautiful technology emerging, Mm. you know, like progression, things growing, things moving. And then you're right, like putting in those, those kids singing, it's supposed to sound reverent, but instead it sounds dark at the same time, despite everything being so consonant and all of that at first, it's like, it's ominous. Yeah, it's 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 very similar to uh, you watch a scary movie and a kid is singing, "My ring around the rosy." <laughs> right. All of a sudden, it just flips what that's supposed to be, which is uh, kind of interesting because actually that song in particular is about dying, but it became a, a children's song, and then we switch it back to <laughs> how it's an ominous piece, actually. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned, Lindsay, the theme of emerging technology, and there is a lot of emerging technology in this show. At one point, uh, we see one of Stephen's daughters. Uh, she has a an avatar, but instead of being an emoji on her phone or tablet or whatever, it's a literal mask on her face, a digital mask uh, that she can hide behind. And I thought that was kind of an interesting take on what could very well happen in the not too distant future. What did you guys think about that and and some of the other little technological advancements, I guess you'd call them, that uh, they predict in the show? I uh, absolutely, uh, her, uh, Bethany, her situation is absolutely heartbreaking as a teacher of teenagers. Just, oh gosh, uh, just broke my heart to watch how she needed that mask. It reminds me of a student I have right now who refuses to be on screen and will just lift her hand up into the frame every once in a while to signal that she's there, but refuses to speak and is just pathologically uncomfortable with who she is. So you know how the, like Mark was saying with the ring around the rosy, the lightheartedness of that, of those avatars masking the pain underneath, it was just, the sweeter it sounded, the more, more horrible you felt for her. I don't know, Eric, what about you? I mean, dealing with a lot of kids who, you know, who can struggle emotionally and getting close to them, how did it make you feel? Yeah, you know, I, I uh, teach in an acting conservatory, so I do deal with um, 
people who tend to be more extroverts. But the idea of technology is continuing to progress in a way that keeps people more at a distance is so believable. And I could imagine, especially the younger generation, really, really holding tight to a way to hide more. And so the idea of, I mean, the whole technology aspect of the show was so fascinating because a lot of it was exciting. You know, the idea of not having to carry your cell phone around and be able to just tap your fingers and, um, and make a phone call. I don't know if I want to get surgery to do that, but it looked, it looked kind of cool and convenient. Um, the whole, um, Alexa, uh, uh type, um, senior, th- senior, senior, right. the, um, yeah. the, the Alexa of that, of that world, um, uh, was, was obviously seemed really convenient and, um, helpful. And ultimately towards when we get to the end of the show could be something I think kind of beautiful the way, the way, where that goes towards the end. But so much of the technology is also terrifying. The idea of what Bethany wants to do at such a young age is, is just heartbreaking. At at one point in the show, right after um, that tense moment between um, the parents and, and her, she um, gives them some information that they're not pleased with. And she runs up the stairs and I don't know if anyone else noticed, but hanging on the wall at the bottom of the stairs is a corded telephone. And I just thought that was interesting that that was still a thing, although they never use it and they always use senior or cell phones or whatever, but there was still a corded telephone that just a, a reminder of simpler times was there on the set. I thought that was clever. Yeah, that's a nice symbolic touch. You know, in thinking about Bethany, if I had to come up with a thematic idea for this entire episode, it would be something that Rosie said, what's real, what's not, how do we know? And I think you can apply that to Bethany. You know, like you hear her say she's transhuman and you're like, mm, that's not a thing. And then that's what her, her parents, they're so kind of, they're dismissive even when she says that she's not trans and they're like, oh, she they're always changing the words, you know? And so they immediately push her out of their family group and their group of understanding. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, well, is that real? (laughs) It turns out to be one of the realer things in the show. I mean, we've got Viv Rook, the politician, what's real about her, Uh, the refugees, you know, what's happened, even that sex with a robot thing, you know, when Rosie goes on that date. Like, what the heck is real here? What is, what is really a connection between people? And what is a lie? What's a conspiracy? Um, uh, that whole thing, I thought, was, it, it reminded me of that play, and Eric had to remind me, it, it, the play, uh, Sylvia, is that the one with the goat? Yeah, yeah it's called, uh, Who is Sylvia? Uh, it's called, um, gosh, uh, yeah, yeah, the subtitle is Who is Sylvia? Why can't I think of, oh, I it's think called it's the, 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 the Goat. goat. Yeah, it's called The, the goat. goat. Yeah, yeah The and Goat. It's what, it's, it's, which is a play about a, a, a man who falls in love with a goat, and then the rest of his family dealing with what is what's going on here? This is not real. And then his argument for why he is in fact love with a goat. And, and it just reminded me of that in a way that I five years ago had a discomfort with sexual trans people. Discomfort, not, a, not, not, you know, I didn't feel like they were wrong. I just go, wow, I haven't actually let this into my conscious yet, you know? And I think it was a, a kind of a reminder of how these things are going to still, there's gonna still going to be the next jarring thing. I mean, like 12 years ago, it was, you know, Prop 8. And, you know, we progressed beyond this. But I thought it was very effective in going like, oh, wait, we're moving too fast. We're moving too fast. We can't accept all this yet. Yeah, it was interesting. I, in fact, one of my favorite moments is when the parents are talking to her. Um, and, well, let me back up just a little bit. One of my least favorite moments is when the mother is invading her daughter's privacy by going into Senor um, and getting her private um, internet history and finds that she's been searching about trans life and adjusting to being trans and all these things and the assumption on the part of the viewer and the parents is that trans is transgender um and so they are coping with that that evening and said we're going to have a united front we're going to support her whatever and then one of my favorite moments that i was referring to is when they uh, have this conversation which interestingly enough they have to schedule with their daughter because 
she can't handle just a normal conversation. So they schedule this appointment to talk with the parents and all this. And um, they think that she's going to come out as transgender and they're very supportive about that. But then when they find out that she actually means transhuman, which is to say that she wants her consciousness to be in essence uploaded to the cloud and have her physical body cease to exist and be recycled into the earth as she says, uh, so that she will be data. Um, that is something that the parents had no idea about, cannot grapple with. And that's when they have that big fight and she runs up the stairs and we see the phone. Um, but initially the first part of that conversation when they're so accepting, I thought was very cool because it's, it's only a couple years in the future at this point. And I think if we actually get to the point in a couple years where a conversation like that could potentially go smoothly for someone to be able to come out to their parents as, as transgender, uh, I think that would be a huge advancement because that's still something that for, I would say, a large portion, if not the majority of the population is still pretty tough to grapple with. Um, and they seem to handle that very well. Unfortunately for them, that was not the conversation that actually happened. But mm-hmm. anyway, I thought that was a, an interesting yeah. take on, on things. The, um, you know, I wanted to just amplify a little bit what Mark was saying about the goat because um, it's written by a, an amazing playwright named Edward Albee and he um, is a gay man who wanted to write a play that would play in a very liberal place like New York City and he wanted to write a play that would cause um, a liberal viewer to go through the the experience that a uh, somebody who does not support gay rights does not understand what it is to be gay he wanted to write a play that liberals could actually experience that journey. Um, And I think it's fascinating that he wrote that as a gay man. And what he does so brilliantly in The Goat is it, it is absurd at first. It is repulsive at times at first. And then it starts to become beautiful. And you start to think, at least my experience, I saw Bill Irwin do it with Sally Field on Broadway, well, my experience was it went from being laughable to being beautiful over the course of two hours, which um, was a really fascinating journey as a very, um, you know, tree hugging liberal guy to go, oh, I guess this is what somebody, something that I find very acceptable that other people don't find acceptable. I guess this is the journey that they go on sometimes. Um, so I just think it's a, a play that sounds so absurd, um, but is really um it's just masterful i think it's a masterful um a piece of work that unfortunately very few theaters can actually produce it right so but, i'm really glad that you said that because it was occurring to me so this a lot of issues in this are set up as black white right wrong real not real so very polarized and so that when we have the experiences the audience of hearing transhuman hearing phrases like christian said recycled the body in, into the earth and you go mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know like we have that same discomfort that same judgy judgy sort of thing you know and it's a, a nice little well, it's not a nice experience but it's a really i think authentic experience and i feel i feel like most of this show is just setting us up to think we know the right answer for something and then to realize that we pretty much know nothing and everything is completely unpredictable. And Yeah. Well, and I think it's so well done too. And I, I, I can only speak for myself, but especially early, like that very first time we meet Vivian Rook, um, Emma Thompson's character, mm-hmm. I was kind of like, yeah, I can kind of, I kind of see where she's going. She's been pushed to, you know, and I think, Again, as as I consider myself a very progressive person, I thought they were masterful. And even having somebody who uh, you know identifies as very progressive kind of go, oh, you know that that thing that Vivian Rook said, I can kind of uh, I can kind of get behind that one. And then she becomes so extreme and so, in my book, repulsive and so just horrible and awful. But you could see how she got people why so many people jumped on board with her at the beginning Mm -hmm. um i don't know if you guys had that experience if there were ever times early on especially where you're like yeah i kind of don't give an f either right you know um a little bit um maybe not about that particular topic but um about sometimes i just want to go i don't care about that we need to focus on some other things that are a little more important 
Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I think it's interesting too that uh, the political party that she started, the Four Star Party, um, is named because of the four letter word that she wasn't supposed to say on air and she did anyway. And she named a political party after it. Yeah, uh, the four the four stars it took to bleep the word. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but when you but when you bleep a, a word, don't you leave the first letter in? And so shouldn't it be F with a th- with three stars? <laughs> <laughs> I, it didn't make sense to me. And then she's like, and and we want to become five five stars. And I was like, like I a hotel rating. But no, that's that's that's, totally, a new, what that's the bitch. Fuck do you think? <laughs> but that's totally Trump. He, he like yeah. he, he goes into. It, you know, it takes something that sort of made sense at first, and then it spins into, wait, now this doesn't make any sense. And again, not that I would say that something that Trump said was um, remotely acceptable, but, um, but, that, um, but that he, he doesn't get it, first of all, and then, and then he spins it into something more. I thought that was kind of brilliant that you know what it was was you know four four letter word and now now it's spinning into five and you're like wait that that you completely that's not where that's not what this was you know <laughs> yeah. that's kind no. of brilliant <laughs> no I oh, thought right. that I thought that it it was so prescient <laughs> because it was it I thought the effect Mark I'm sorry Mark we're going with Nostradamus oh, oh I'm so oh, sorry yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Um, I was going to say prophetic, but <laughs> but um, the the thing that Trump does effectively is he says you're having pain, and let me give you a punching bag for that pain. And also, we're we're spending a lot of money on things that are contributing to your pain. At the very least, dissuading us from actually helping you. So if we get rid of these crises that we're dealing with in the Middle East. If we just stop dealing with them, then um, your life will be better. And then the whole underlying, like, she doesn't give a fuck, is a um, is basically the, n- like, not being PC element of his, mm-hmm. you know, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Did I offend you? Well, now you're listening to me. And right. more people, and nowadays with the, I, I think it was in newsroom, is that the, the goal for the news is to, to, to create an informed electorate. And now where people get their truth from whatever source they decide to get their truth from, then truth doesn't make a good argument, but hits make, make you more popular. So you get yeah. more hits on your website because you did something like say fuck on the air that all of a sudden becomes a new truth for people. So. Yeah. And speaking of truth, how about Ralph and his con- conspiracy theories? And you yeah, know, that's exactly of, of the couple, who do I like better? Well, I like Ralph right now because he's not a cheating bastard. And you know, and he's sweet and he's lovely, but he's a little cuckoo, uh, you know, for Cocoa Puffs because he's, <laughs> you know, picking up these things and he's intrigued by them and he wants to know more. He wants to know more truths. But what he's searching for unconventional things, unconventional oh, truths that still make him feel good. And you know, when he said, I'm not saying I'm absolutely right, but you can't say that I'm absolutely wrong. Right. And I was like, I, you got me there. I don't know. Lindsay and I are, are currently watching a masterclass by Neil deGrasse Tyson um, on just scientific thinking. And a couple of brilliant things that he said was like, it, it takes the same amount of intellectual laziness to have someone come up to you and say, I have two crystals are rubbing together and then they cure me of all my diseases. It takes the same amount of intellectual laziness to say, oh, I'll buy them from you. What do you want for them? For them? Or to say, oh, that's a scam. I absolutely think that what you're saying is a, a lie. Uh, both of those involve no effort on your own, but a pre-bias to what the truth actually is. And that, and then the other thing that he said was that the one of the worst things to happen to scientific thinking is the internet. Because any bias you have, you can go to this machine and say, is this true? And it will tell you it is. And it will say uh, beautifully with a lot of nice voices that yes, you are absolutely right. There was a conspiracy to do whatever. Yeah. And th- that truth is now subjective to where you look for it. Yeah. No, I, 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 that's so beautiful. What a, it, I can't wait to watch that masterclass, Jack. You know, we're, we're, we're going to, um, we're going to purchase it next week. We're excited. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it, right now we don't go to a source to discover the facts. We, 
we have the facts in our head and then go look for the source to support those facts or whatever the facts we think the facts are. What do you guys, what do you guys actually, it, what, what is your trusted source of news now? What, what do you go to that you can go, okay, I, I, I trust this and this is where I can actually maybe, I mean, maybe even the better question is, um, is there a source of news out there that could change your mind? That if they reported something that, that went against something that you thought was real, but if they reported it, it could change your mind. Yeah, I, I don't know that there is necessarily a uh, totally trusted news source anymore. Uh, since news has become entertainment and it's all about how many clicks you get or you know sustained viewership, it's all about keeping folks tuned in. And so most of the, the big names in news are targeting a certain demographic and so they're feeding them the information that they want rather than necessarily the information that they need. So the prime example that everyone could speak to is, is Fox News. And even though they, they may give you portions or versions of the truth, it's very colored with a lot of commentary. Um, but the same thing happens on MSNBC and CNN and all of the major news sources have their commentators that a lot of people mistake for news. So if you're watching Rachel Maddow or if you're watching um, Sean Hannity, you're not getting news from those people. You're getting opinion that is related to the news. And so unless you are thinking critically enough to understand that what you're getting is opinion rather than news, I, I don't think you're necessarily getting the whole picture. At least you're, you're getting a very colored version of the truth. Um, so that, that makes it a lot more difficult. I think maybe NPR... The one that I like the best is BBC World. Um, I think their news is is relatively unbiased. But in general, I think it's really tough these days to to find news that is really fair and balanced, as Fox News likes to say. Um, it's it's getting harder and harder. And I I kind of miss the days when you had a Walter Cronkite or somebody who was just reading the news, not giving an opinion on the news. So uh, years back, I subscribed to the Week and it actually came in the mail. And there, the big topics that were being discussed, the week would compile all the different responses from different publications. And so you could read through and see how each news organization addressed it. And I felt like that was just such a wonderful thing. And then later on when I didn't have the week anymore, I was like, well, how am I gonna do this? And so on, when I look at Google News on my computer, it looks one way. When I look at it on my phone, it looks another way. And on my phone, it can break uh, down like a bunch of responses to the same topic. So it does a similar thing. So I can just skim through and see what the headlines are, how it's being presented, and read through a couple of them to kind of try to find the truth in there somewhat. But in terms of like watching news, absolutely not. I can't do it. Mark watches it, you know, every day, and it's a big part of what he does. I can't handle it because it all sounds like absolute crap to me, and I can't, I, I trust no one. <laughs> yeah. so. To bring it back to years and years, I think they oh, do yeah. a pretty good job of keeping the news as part of the show. They constantly have a radio broadcast in the background where they, they give you a little bit of filler information about what's happening around the world, about financial collapses in, in certain sectors, and um, you know, elections that are coming up and the news is still very much a thing. In fact, uh, the character Viv, uh, she talks about fake news a lot of times when, when there's some kind of controversy involving her, she dismisses it, uh, which of course is, is very familiar to all of us now. And uh, I, I think that was a, a, a clever thing for them to do is to be able to give you some exposition in a way that didn't feel like exposition. So they could tell you that financial markets were having difficulty and, that uh, America was going through a huge financial crisis. It was just a little bit on the news, um, but that affects Stephen because he's in the financial markets. And mm -hmm. um, I, th I thought that was a, a nice use of, of just a little bit of, of uh, exposition to, to further the story without having it drag on into a, an unnecessary scene. Yeah, I think it's interesting because the, when you were talking, Christian, about the different news networks, the... Um, what I was hearing is, you know, a for-profit versus a not-for-profit um, right. situation. You know, obviously uh, the American 
uh, news networks are a for-profit organization. NPR is a not-for-profit organization. They, they, um, they are not necessarily motivated by how many people um, are, are tuning in. They are motivated by how many people decide to donate. They, they survive on, on grants and uh, different, different things. So there is finance involved in NPR, but it's not um, trying to sell advertising. Right. They're not trying. They're not trying to get the My Pillow guy to do a commercial. Um, you know, <laughs> um, and BBC, if I'm not mistaken, is is a state. I don't. I don't know if the word is state sponsored, but it's it is. Yeah. It, it, it's it's the government um, seeing the news as a necessary part of of society. So it's what Walter Cronkite was. That that's what's happened. Is is it's about trying to get people to tune in. Fox News has cornered a market on a particular area of the population, so they report news that will get those folks to tune in. But all of the news sources that I see on television, other than um, NPR, I agree with you, I think NPR does it well. And that's what I find really frustrating is, is there's a game to it as opposed to a reality to it. I'm looking at the front page of USA Today or the 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 site, and there's just it's like it's it's multiple personalities. It can't quite figure out what it wants to focus on. Trump's comments about troops, you know, as idiots or whatever, or the poll where many Americans uh, think that Trump is going to win the debate. Which, of course, you know that type of poll. It's really meaningful, isn't it? You know, like what what people think is going to happen, regular yeah. people. So. That's that's an interesting thing that's happened before with USA Today in particular because they're a national newspaper rather than a regional one. They will have different headlines and and different front page stories depending on what region you buy it in. Wow. So um, if if you look back at when the scandals with Bill Clinton and stuff, if if you looked at uh, one region's thing, they were always talking about the stain on the dress. And if you were looking at a different region, the headline was different, or it may not even have been the same story. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. That's clearly motivated by money. The, the strange thing is that the reason there's television news in the first place is when the FCC first gave out broadcasting licenses to television stations, one of the stipulations was they had to have a certain percentage of their programming day dedicated to news and information so weather and news as a public service, because they were given these broadcasting spectrums for free, but in order to get them for free, they had to produce some news. And so initially, when you would watch the evening news, it was not a moneymaker at all. Um, it was simply to meet the requirements so that they could have this station with all the other programs that did make them money. But eventually, they started to realize that it was a moneymaker maker. And now you have entire stations dedicated to the 24-hour news cycle, which I think also contributes to the division that you see because people are consuming things at all hours and everyone mm -hmm. thinks they're an expert because they watched, you know, an hour and a half of television news. Well, that's what's so alluring about Viv Rook, isn't it? Doesn't she break things down into understandable chunks of black and white and good and bad? And I don't give up, you know, like, I just want to, I just don't want people to park on the sidewalk because my mom uses a walker, you know, like taking away all the complexity that's inherent in every single thing that exists in the world and making it super simple and easy to understand. And people are like, sign me up. Everything's too complicated. You know, like, tell it to me real. That's what I want. And uh, misunderstanding for a complexity as a roadblock you know, it, and, and wanting to do this clear path of like instant understanding of something. It's, there's no wonder she's so attractive to uh, and, people. And it's so great that that's why everybody needs to watch years and years because mm -hmm. we see what happens with that type of leadership. We see what happens with that type of mentality. At mm -hmm. first it would be like, oh, okay, yeah, well that, that's, I, I'm attracted to that. that. That would be nice for the world to be that black and white. But as you watch years and years, you realize and you get to see possibly nostradamically what is going to happen um, if we stop thinking critically, if we stop thinking in nuance and we just try to reduce the world to, to a black and white world. Yeah, when, when your decisions become more emotional than rational, then there's some serious problem for sure. You, Eric, asked where I get our news source, my news oh. sources is from. Mine is Justin Penza. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, because Justin took it upon himself 
to he every time there's a story that's out there he reads five different sources on it and he can't do that as much because he's trying to get his degree finished his master's degree finished now but he watches something on any news and then goes to fox and sees how they're covering it and then goes to al jazeera and see how they're covering it and said it's 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 fascinating because you can actually tell the truth on all the stations more or less but have it completely nuanced just on what you highlight, what you gloss over, right. you know. I, I think it's fascinating because every time I come to a quandary, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, how on earth is this possible? And then I go to Justin, he will give me the counter argument. He will say, this is what, this is what the other side is arguing. This is what I see them doing. So I was going to ask a question to bring us back to years and years, just a little bit. I about remember that characters. show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Um, would love to know who is your favorite or most intriguing character. And I want to, I want to start off by saying intriguing character for me, it's Rosie because she is, um, okay. She's, uh, she's, uh, that man says to her, you're hard work. And she's like, oh yeah, she's assertive. She's open. She's unapologetic. She's funny, she's sexual, but she's also a huge hypocrite. Did you know, like, like she, um, she's so admirable to me in so many ways. And then she, well, she's attracted to Viv Rook. So she likes her because she's all no nonsense and kind of in your face. But then when she goes on that date with the man and she finds the little, you know, thing for the robot and he's just like, no, it's just, you know, it's just something you do. And she like gets out of there as if she's not a person who is unapologetic about her need for sex. And then she, you know, judges him for it. So I like her, but I kind of hate her a little bit too. Yeah, I agree. Uh, one of the really interesting things about that character is that she is disabled. She has spina bifida, which I thought was great on the part of whoever the, the casting person was that they decided to be inclusive not only racially but with people of different abilities and that actress incidentally actually has spina bifida so she that's that's actually part of her everyday life but yeah i thought i thought she was brilliant and i agree that it was a little bit not upsetting necessarily but i, I felt a little um ashamed of her for being so exclusionary once the the robot revelation came about um and did anyone else notice i don't know if any of you are doctor who fans but that robot was uh it had a striking resemblance to a cyberman from doctor who uh <laughs> so that, i think that was an intentional nod on the part of russell but yeah and that that's another thing too those robots that's an actual thing in parts of asia i guess where the population is given up on the idea of having a genuine relationship and so they have digital relationships with cartoon avatars and they use artificial physical means to take care of business. <laughs> uh, so that's not too far off the mark. I don't think, I think that was a little bit forward thinking based in reality. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I, I really enjoy the character of Daniel. I hated him. I thought I, I loved him and hated him. He was very complicated. He was married to Ralph at the beginning, who was admittedly a little bit dim in comparison. I think Daniel was a much bigger thinker than, than Ralph was. And Ralph clearly was susceptible to conspiracy theories and that sort of thing. But when Daniel completely abandoned that relationship, especially after towards the end of the show, after the, the yeah. big explosion, he leaves the family entirely and goes to Victor at the refugee camp. I thought that was totally understandable and totally sickening at the same time. Uh, his, his relationship with his family, but particularly with his partners is very complicated and interesting to watch unfold. Yeah. I think the, um, the show is masterful in the way that it got me to um, have a different, a different favorite character throughout the, the process. It, it, it switched a lot for me. I think if I had to pick one, Edith is, is somebody who I, um, I, I just was really drawn to Edith. I like somebody who is um, active who doesn't just sit around and talk about things, but actually goes out and does it. Um, so, so I guess there was a, a little bit where I kind of wanted to be more like Edith, uh, especially when we get l later and she, and she, um, and she goes into the camps to liberate and all that stuff. That's, that's exciting stuff. Um, 
for me and to get on a boat and go go places to try to actually uh, affect change so i um i i think i often talk a good game but don't always back it up with action so i i was uh, i'm impressed with with her um her actually putting her her money where her mouth is i also liked victor a lot at times especially um in the in the latter half after um he comes back to england and all of the tragedy that happens for him when he when he comes back i have to say because we've mentioned him a few times i find ralph to be the most terrifying of all of the characters the fact that somebody who is i would say seemed like an educated guy was so susceptible to things like the flat earth society and things like that 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 is terrifying to me that um that people are that easily swayed to a conspiracy and 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 the sad thing is people are i when i first heard that the flat earth society existed i was like what the hell and then to go and realize how um how many people actually believe this is unbelievably shocking and i and i of course i'm i'm not shy about talking about politics so forgive me but that's the saddest most depressing most heartbreaking thing for me about the whole trump era is i thought that about five percent of the country were awful and trump has made me realize that about 35 percent of the country is awful um and that makes me really sad yeah might be a little bit higher than that even uh, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you, oh, sorry. I'm just going to ask the same question uh, that that she asked. But uh, you guys covered it already, uh, and you know it's hard because I know the whole show, and so I know where these arcs are going to go. Um, but uh, for me, even though I know the whole show, I think Victor, I think represents uh, uh, the unattainable, unattainable purity that everybody else is so riddled with these. Um, with the, the, these demons, everybody has a bad side. Some of them are able to rise out of them. Uh, some of them bef- become victims of their own depravity. But uh, I thought Victor was a good example of an innocent person being thrust into this world. And uh, he didn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really have a hero's journey, but he just kind of represents a homing beacon of truth to me. Uh, so not, t- not the most interesting, but... I just hated everybody else so much that he, yeah. I just appreciated his his influence. If if I were to think though, if I'm thinking in terms of like the whole series, and yeah, and it's hard not to. It's uh, the the person for me is Bethany. Uh, the way she rises, the mm-hmm. way she becomes the thing that she wants to be. In the same way, Eric, I appreciate somebody who they have a feeling they have an impulse and they will follow it and follow it through. And I think she had some bumps along the way, of course, but she kept growing. And so in that way, I like, I like her the best. I hate everyone though. Yes. <laughs> I hate everyone. And I even watching in this first episode, um, Steven. So Steven and Celeste and Celeste treats his, his mom just horribly, you know, just so rude, it says horrible things about her. And he alternates between this sort of like, come on, like, let's calm down, and then enjoying her doing that as well. It's like, I feel like everybody in the show is a big old hypocrite. And, you yeah. know, act the way that feels good in the moment, you know, it's no firm moral standing. I think that's what it is. That's what bothers me. Yeah, and I like the, the the fact that when the the bomb hit, like it's so jarring to everybody that all of that uh, like quiet desperation that they all live in are not quite telling the truth, not quite being their moral center or f- knowing their moral center. All of a sudden, gets stripped away, and uh, and uh, he runs to Victor, and uh, and she mouths off to the mom, and all these like this becomes very raw and real for a moment. But then, as we know it's what happens, I mean, that gloss is over and we go back to playing the caricatures or the avatars that we usually are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way I, this... Sorry, go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say, I, I love how stories and, and the, the way we tell stories is, is progressing um, and, and starting to break the rules. An artistic art form progresses by there being an established set of rules and then somebody coming along and breaking those rules and everybody saying you can't do that that's not how it works and then 
people start to like the broken rules and then the broken rules now become the new established set of rules and there, therefore we progress. Oh, um, mm -hmm. And uh, we follow it in um, visual art, we can talk, follow it with, in music, we can follow it in um, theater, um, we can follow it through so many different art works in, in any type of art form. And what I, I'm so fascinated by is this ability now to write really complex characters that there isn't necessarily an identifiable hero and an, an identifiable uh, villain. There's so many times where somebody will ask, especially when you're directing a play or you're helping try to, to develop a new play, well, wh who's the protagonist and who's the antagonist? And, and, and we're getting, it's getting harder to identify that. Uh, obviously, there's uh, a, a relatively new trend of the anti-hero. I think Breaking Bad being one of the best examples of that right. um, out there where you, somebody is so doing so many bad things and let you, yet you continue to root for that person. I, I just am amazed at, the, the, at, at people's brains and their ability to pull this, this art form apart and and come at it in a completely different way because it, it sounds crazy for us to be so passionate and excited about a television show where we readily readily admit how much we disliked everybody but then we could also talk about many moments where we were very supportive of of these people and i think they're just getting really good at putting real people and real real life in a, in a into a dramatic form and something that I noticed you talk about the storytelling aspect. Um, one of the least interesting characters for me yeah, was right the now. storyteller. Yeah. The, the, the neighbor that uh, Daniel takes into work, the scene between the two of them in the car, that is the one uh, moment in the entire series that I was taken out of the series because it seemed very unrealistic to me that, I don't know, she would just go into this diatribe about her job as a storyteller. Just It did not ring true to me. Did anyone else feel that? Yeah, it's like the author stepped in there and said, I'd like to tell you how I really feel about this project that you're currently watching right now. <laughs> Storytelling is an art, and I am <laughs> an artiste. You know, that's, that's what I, I felt about that. And then later on when she's giving that, she's telling that story and everybody's into it and, and you've got Victor and Danny kind of hiding out in the open and holding right. hands, you know, and being a part of that. And that, by the way, that was just, uh, it just made me so mad. I hated that scene so very much. <laughs> right. The beginning yeah, of the like, end. Uh, I totally agree with you, Christian. Fran uh, was put there at, in this episode to let us know that we're watching a story. <laughs> right, right. So this, this whole thing began, the, the whole episode starts being introduced to these characters, the grandmother and, and her adult grandchildren and all this. And Rosie is going to the hospital because she's a little bit premature in the birth of her son, uh, Lincoln. And uh, the kind of catalyst that was most compelling to me was Danny holding his new nephew and uh, kind of opining on what the future will be like for him. And so he he kind of says, you know, what's it going to be like politically? What's it going to be like uh, socially and all these things? And then we go into that fantastic montage where we have all of the events in everybody's lives, uh, the wedding between Ralph and Danny, the passing of the queen, Donald Trump's uh, second presidency. All of these things happen. Brexit. Uh, I think Brexit, Brexit happens. In yep. The but it's all done within this, this montage and it's all tied together by birthday cakes. So Lincoln's first birthday cake happens and then second birthday cake and it gets to his fifth birthday. So we get to 2024. I also thought it was interesting that your grandmother's 90th birthday cake happens in that montage. So we get an idea of how old this woman is and she's still around at the end of the series so she's 100 by the time we're all said and done with everything. But I just thought that montage was, was brilliant to be able to fit in all that information in a relatively short period of time and to propel us five years into the future in a relatively short period of time and, and get us from real life today to the not too distant future and see how much can dramatically change in such a short period of time. So that by the time we get to the end of the episode, when Trump goes off the rails and uh, that Chinese island is destroyed, we, mm -hmm. we get propelled very quickly into that situation. And part of the reason that was done so well is that music that I was referencing, the Into the Future music, where it's 
got that sense of forward momentum right. over and over and it just meshes so perfectly and it sounds as we we're talking about as mark reference it sounds so consonant it sounds so beautiful but it also sounds off slightly it's it's a little it's a little too much and i think if 2020 has taught us anything that we can understand that feeling of forward progression and not knowing what's coming next but knowing something big is going yeah. to come next yeah in in the series and in life these days you keep thinking well okay that's it nothing else can possibly happen and then murder hornets it's, <laughs> it's really really bizarre I was going to say something about the montage. I think montages are scary when I see them because it pulls you out of being invested in the character in their space, but they are occasionally brilliant. The opening of Up, I think, is my favorite montage. The ending of Six Feet Under is one of my favorite mon mon montages ever, just because we got to know all the characters. I thought it was very brave to go, we're going to give you a little bit of exposition on these characters and then immediately start the fast forward so you don't get to sit with them for a while. But I thought it was really well done because it prepared me for what the show is actually about, which is not necessarily the drama in the moment, but actually the 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 long term effects of the path we are headed on right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, about that right before the montage when when Danny's holding Lincoln and and kind of wondering what the future is. Um, part of me, in my own resolution to everything, is hoping that all of that turmoil and strife and grief that happens over the course of the rest of the series is just him imagining what might happen in the next several years in Lincoln's <laughs> life and that that's not actually what will happen and that things will really turn out much better. That, that, that's my hope is that in, in reality, that's what happened and it was just a dream. <laughs> in years and years too, that's right. how it opens. Right. It's going to be like Dallas. <laughs> it, it, yeah, de decades and decades is the next series. Yeah. Right. I have to say that um, uh, the the difference a year makes is um, is really interesting. I was just sitting here thinking about a year ago right now, we were watching Years and Years and um, Chernobyl. And this week, Jackie and I have binged um, The Babysitter's Club and Kissing Booth 1 and 2. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so, yeah. um, hey, they're, they I enjoyed them um, immensely. So So check them out. It's, it's interesting to think about the fact that you and Jackie watched this a year ago before coronavirus was a thing and the world was still relatively normal. And then we watched it now. It, it must have been a very, very different experience for the two of you than it was for the rest of us because the world has forever changed in the last six, seven months. And that was that hadn't happened yet when you guys were watching it. So this, although it, I'm sure it seemed very plausible, wasn't quite the same experience that it was for the rest of us. I think it was unbelievably plausible, but seemed far in the, far in the distance. Um, and so watch, watching it now, I would imagine would be like, oh my God, where it, it's, it's happening. Yeah. For us, it was kind of like, this could totally happen. Yep. Hopefully, hopefully we take some steps to make it not happen. And, and if it were to happen, it's a ways off. Yeah, now I think that it's got to be pretty rough to sit in the middle of it. I have a sort of related question, but sort of not. Have any of you heard of anybody who's watched this and say this is all bullshit? Um, you know, has like I want to introduce my mom to this because my mom has become a Trump fight and a Fox News watcher, and I cannot get her off of that soapbox. And I kind of want to let her see this, but I have I have been down this road several times with her trying to give her evidence, and she's just like no fake news and um this would be an interesting thing i was anybody else find that like i'm i don't know a lot of people that are trump fights but uh it would be interesting to have them watch it and say does this ring true at all <laughs> i shamefully yet happily live in a bubble <laughs> yeah so um i i just don't have those people in my uh people I don't have people in my life that believe that way that are close enough that I would have this deep of a conversation with them. Ah, okay. um, I, I have, I'm sure I have acquaintances um, and maybe people who come to the theater and uh, we enjoy saying hi to each other in the lobby. But um, I don't, I don't know anybody that I would have this 
have a long enough conversation with. And that's sad. That's sad. I'd be interested in hearing uh, I would too. somebody's point of view from um, who who doesn't think this is plausible. I'd really like to know why they don't think it's plausible because it sure seems like it. I mean, just the the uh, we you know again spoilers, but we're headed towards concentration camps in this television show. And I it was new to me. Maybe people already knew about the Uyghur concentration camps, but I didn't know about the Uyghur concentration camps until um, I found out that Trump told the Chinese that it was fine, they could go ahead and have those concentration camps. I, I think that uh, what's happening on the border um, with uh, children and, and people being put into cages, that's starting to feel a lot like uh, concentration camps to me. So there you go. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how as each day passes, the reality um, kind of lines up with what happens in the show. Joan was mentioning earlier that uh, there are enough seeds planted in reality that blossom during the show. And it's, it's frightening to see they've gone through so many small scenarios that add up to be huge crises. And it's, it's frightening how plausible it all is. For those of you who don't know, Joan is our producer. Um, uh, uh, I have a note about Joan every time I look up Joan's just you know smiling at me and it's just very affirming (laughs) it seems like she totally gets what I'm saying and is (laughs) (laughs) we've been going for a little over an hour so uh, why don't we uh, wrap this up with some overall first impressions with the first episode Lindsay overall it's shot so well, as Eric said, it's written so well. The characters are written so well. They're uh, played so well. Never, um, it's the subject is uncomfortable. The events are uncomfortable. And I wanted to watch the second one immediately this morning after watching the first one. It's so well done. And um, I, uh, I am terrified, but I also appreciate the <laughs> the nostradamic like <laughs> aspect of this mark um i i thought that um the nostradamic word was brilliant <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's the only thing i appreciate about this whole experience no <laughs> no i thought that, i thought it was uh, i just want to say shakespeare invented words so i get to <laughs> as well you get. That's I, yours, I, man. I yes. we're gonna have to pay him for that <laughs> um i exactly what Lindsay said the clarity of heroism was just abandoned you know, in this, but you still were drawn into it. And like Eric was saying with the anti-hero, that's it's a fascinating way, but that this wasn't that either. This was, uh, this was circumstance. It, it's the slow erosion of, of personality into or out of something that was so fascinating to me. Um, and it just caught me. It was immediately apparent in the first episode. That's yeah. all I have to say. Very, very real people in extraordinary circumstances. That's exciting right. to watch. That's, mm-hmm. you know, um, to see very real people under heightened circumstances. That's, that's true theater. I, I, I think that's, you know, sometimes people say they want to see real life on stage. I don't agree with that. I can go out in the parking lot and watch real life. I want to see heightened. I want to see real life in heightened circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's what this does for us. I think that it was, um, I want to say addictive, um, but I also want to say groundbreaking. I want to say rule shattering. I, I, I think it was just something that I was in, so intrigued by because I hadn't seen anything like it. So maybe maybe the word I'll say is intriguing mm-hmm. um, is what it was what for me is what really got me hooked in. And then I'm also a sucker for amazing performances. So, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there, as you said, there, there were no heroes. There were just regular people. There were no cops and firefighters and saving lives and all that stuff. It was just ordinary people living their ordinary lives the best way they knew how under extraordinary circumstances. I I think it was a, a brilliant first episode, a great introduction to what I think is a brilliant series Although I will say that I think that this series may have a little bit of a limited life because as we get further into the future, hopefully <laughs> we won't follow this series. Things will be a little bit better. And so, you know, in, in 2024, this series may not be as relevant as it is today. But I think it's important that uh, 
everyone wakes up to the current situation. And as Lindsay said, uh, it, the series makes you uncomfortable. And I think we all need to be uncomfortable right now and uh, realize that things are not right in so many ways. And it's our responsibility as citizens of the world to do what we can to uh, help right the wrongs that are happening and to ensure that uh, people that are oppressed and kind of under the thumb of Vivian Rook, <laughs> that uh, we can help to, to bring them out of that and make it a better world for ourselves and for everyone else. So, and um, let's sprinkle just a little bit of Babysitter's Club in there along the way. <laughs> of, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you everyone for your participation. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll do this again for episode two and we'll go from there. So thanks everybody. We really appreciate you listening. I'd like to thank our producer, Joan and Mark, Eric and Lindsay for participating. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please tune in next time when we talk about episode two of years and years until next time. Take care. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.